Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Room Weekend Review. This show was recorded on October 17, 2022. Here are the major topics we'll touch on today with our main guest. Census in progress in Armenia. Finally, after two years of delay, the third decennial census is underway in Armenia and hardly anyone is aware of it. We'll talk about this. Meetings in Astana. Another large international summit, this time of the CIS leaders, took place in Kazakhstan. Pashinyan gave a plenary speech and talked with Putin and Aliyev. Mirzoyan had meetings with Lavrov and Bayramov. Developments in Iran. We'll also talk about the ongoing protests in Iran and their significance to Armenia, as well as Iran's politics and policies towards its neighbors in the north. Later on in the show, we'll include conversations on the following topics. Armenian websites compromised. We'll talk with security expert Arthur Papian about a number of recent cyber attacks against Armenian websites. How serious were they and what do website operators need to do in order to reduce the risk from such attacks? Remembering the Tor Artillery Unit. In our last segment, we'll talk about the fate of the Tor Artillery Unit, who allegedly due to misdirection and false intelligence was sent to their death during the 44-day war. October 12th is the unofficial date of their remembrance. We'll feature a short excerpt from our earlier recorded discussion with family members about this harrowing incident. Before we begin the show, we'd like to request that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe and rate our podcasts, which you can listen to wherever you get your podcasts. We're also very active on Facebook, both as a group and a page. All our groom links are on our Linktree page, which we'll make sure that you can find on our profile pages on social media. So you can click on it and find us on all social media platforms. So if you like our shows, please share with your friends and follow us everywhere you're used to getting your Armenian news. Thanks, and on with the show. And now, let's turn to our main guest, Herant Mikhailian, a political scientist and multidisciplinary researcher in political sciences based in Yerevan. He's also a senior researcher at the Caucasus Institute. Hello, and welcome to the show, Herant. Hello. Hello, Herant. All right, so let's uh, jump into our first topic. The third post-Soviet census is currently in progress in Armenia, and there's been very little public advertising and information uh, about this. Uh, almost nobody is thinking about it. And as you know, awareness and support of the census is a major factor in its success and the ultimate quality of its data. The census is being actively conducted from October 13 to the 23rd, so we are smack in the middle of it. And our guest is a close follower of it. So, Rant, why do they pick October to conduct this census? Uh, generally, it's because they picked October in 2001, and then they picked the same days in 2011 and now uh, October 13 to 22 it's in 2022 so in terms of comparability it matters because uh, you know the uh, migration status of majority of population uh, is stick to the season and uh, uh, of course it's better to have it in the low migration season which is in Armenia late uh, January and February, and maybe first half of March, but generally February is the best time. Uh, But unfortunately, they held it in uh, October first time in 2001, and then since then they repeat it. Now, uh, why it matters? Because the seasonal migrants, the uh, labor migrants who, who leave Armenia to work in mainly Russia, uh, there are about 60,000 people annually, and they come back in the end of the year. So if you conduct the census in October, you um, skip most of them because they didn't return yet. And uh, that's a problem. Of course, you can count them from the words of uh, their relatives, uh, but in this case, there will be an absent population, so they will be counted as the Euro population, not de facto, and that's still a problem because we need to uh, better track the population which lives in Armenia, let's say by January 1st, which is uh, which is a period when most uh, population statistics is counted. So most of population statistics refers to January 1st of every year. So the closer you are to January 1st, the better it is. So that's a, that's a problem on, on this side. 
Okay. But at the same time, they are trying to keep the same dates as previous. Harant, has Armenia consistently conducted the census since its independence? Uh, and how does it rate within the post-Soviet state context in consistency and accuracy? Well, in uh, let's start from accuracy. The first census, which was held in uh, 2001, was not perfect. Uh, it overcounted some people who were absent from Armenia for already a rather long time. So some of people who have already migrated, uh, like, let's say, uh, within five-year range before before the census, they were counted as a um, as a resident population because uh, because they were asked people were asked if someone is absent less than five years from Armenia, this means they can still uh, be considered as uh, as uh, um, permanent population, and uh, that's why there was a big discrepancy still. But uh, but still, it made a correction because before that, uh, it was counted that there are three point point eight million people in Armenia, and nobody believed that. And as I said, at that time, people started thinking that in reality, it's not even three; it's uh, one or two million people in Armenia. So that rumor started from there. Uh, but the census brought the correction, and the second census, uh, which was held in twenty eleven, was. Uh, Kind of better, uh, not not perfect still, but uh, but significantly better. And based on metadata on the of the census, I was able to count Armenia's population to the big accuracy. So uh, so I think the, the second census was more or less okay. Uh, comparing to other post-Soviet nations, well, first of all, you need to have a census regularly. So ten year time frame is uh, is considered a standard more than 10 years it's already too much uh, that's why uh, yeah that's why uh, we had the uh, first in 2001 and it was delayed because uh, at the time they wanted to held it in 99 but we're not able and uh, probably october is also uh, due to delay uh, it is also selected due to delay but anyway uh, 2011 was uh, picked uh, to have 10 years time frame after the first census, and the third census was projected to be held in uh, 2020. It's uh, 2020 round of censuses globally. Uh, yeah, initially it was uh, American idea to have censuses on the years which are. Uh, like the zero years and with zero yeah with with the zero in the end uh, but uh, but the coronavirus uh, did not let it to happen in armenia and in many other countries although americans had their census in 2020 yeah, yeah we did and already yeah and already with uh, although the results, results have been delayed this time for us yeah results have been delayed but already you can you can access them Yes. I don't, uh, speaking about accuracy, uh, we're having this discussion as uh, mobilization efforts in Russia are coming to an end. Um, and there's talk about a large number of uh, Russian citizens coming to Armenia. Uh, is there a way to determine whether those are ethnic Armenians who are avoiding uh, mobilization and maybe have decided to move here for at least medium or long term, or uh, whether these are sort of more temporary uh, Russians who will, you know, who don't have long term plans with Armenia. Unfortunately, we don't have good data for that. There was a opinion poll conducted by the government, like maybe one or two months ago, and unfortunately, they did not ask uh, the question of uh, the origins. Of, of those who came. So we don't know. There was a, the poll regarded the uh, Russian immigrants to Armenia. So if I'm not mistaken, uh, some 25 to 30 percent uh, had intention to stay in Armenia for more or less long time. Uh, and, uh, and around the 30 more percent were thinking of staying for until, until uh, they have clarity about Russia. And some had intention to leave Armenia for uh, European countries. So 
Mm, so up to half might might stay in Armenia, uh, but it might turn out that uh, no one will stay. It depends on many factors. So mm, so I think uh, mm, the the big issue with newcomers is that we don't track them much because they are not uh, classic refugees on one hand, but on other hand, um, they are not. Uh, classic mi migrants as well because they came just for uh, eventual reason which might change like tomorrow let's imagine if the war between Russia and Ukraine start, stops tomorrow uh, then they might leave so uh, migrants uh, usually come on purpose uh, usually have some economic tracks in mind and that's what is absent here so this migration wave is a bit different from uh, what we have observed usually but uh, I think it's developing in an uh, interesting manner. I have another question on accuracy. I think the direct sampling rate is set to 25% this time around, right? Is this sufficient for an accurate count? Uh, depends. I've asked uh, Armstadt employees and they told me that uh, they are planning to ask for uh, demographic indicators across whole nation. So the sampling will be 100%. While the rest, uh, while the rest questions like uh, economic, uh, ethnic origin, and so on, will be covered only for one fourth of population. But uh, in all media publications, which I found, there was uh, mentioned that only one fourth will be counted. So um, it depends what will happen in reality. Because at this, at this point, I did not hear from anyone who have been contacted by the census conductors. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe they will account uh, the whole population through population registers or somehow, and then they will um, access one force. So it depends. You need to account everyone. Maybe you, yeah, if you ask only one force, uh, if you ask uh, like... Uh, questions about employment or something like that, one-fourth is still enough. Uh, but uh, in order to know the exact number of people in country, you need to ask everyone, like 100% literally. And uh, this time, Russia encountered this problem. They were not able to, to, um, to cover a whole population. And uh, according to Levada poll, uh, it turned out that only 57% were accounted during the census. The rest said no one contacted them or their families. Mm -hmm. So they have been counted through population registers or local registers uh, up until up, up until condominiums. But uh, uh, of course, people might underestimate their participation in census because maybe their relatives uh, have accounted them and did not tell them or something else. But anyway... Uh, this Russian census is most probably the least accurate among uh, the three Russian censuses which have been conducted after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Concerning Armenia, well, let's see. Let's see. At least I see several risks, among which uh, are first is the uh, October issue, which which I've already discussed. Second is, yeah, second is the number of Artsakhi. Um, refugees who are living in Armenia and who are about 15 to 20,000 people and we don't know how how they are going to account them or some or maybe they will skip them or maybe they will not be able to uh, to cover fully because refugees are always vulnerable from the point of view of uh, census uh third is uh, russian migrants how they will be accounted that's another issue because migrants especially newcomers are also vulnerable from the point of view of counting, and uh, and then and then the twenty five percent issue. So there are number of issues which might uh, harm the census and uh, uh, hit the accuracy of the census. Let's see how it will go. Yeah, yeah. Harant, are minorities properly broken out in the census data? At least in two thousand and one and twenty eleven ethnic and religious minorities well were were normally covered mm -hmm. uh, and i hope i hope uh, it will stay the same in 2022 because 
Armenian census system and uh, population register is based on the Soviet system and uh, the local minorities, let's say the uh, minorities who are well rooted in Armenia, they are perfectly counted because because the system which was set up in the Soviet Union was ready to account such communities. Now, with with the mig migrant communities, it's much harder to account. So let's see how, how they will handle this. Okay. If Ar Armenian statistics is able to do that, I think we can say that uh, it's a big step forward. And I can say that uh, after first uh, hand results, I will al al already be able to to make a judgment uh, to which extent the census um, was okay or not. Okay. So historically, what sort of policies have come about as a result of the census data? Well, the mm, two major directions follow the census. Usually it's uh, housing and, uh, and then it's a uh, labor market. In Armenia, it did not have strict connection because uh, the housing was uh, left on its own. So, for example, in post-Soviet period, in Armenia, the, ho the housing stock has grown twice fold, twofold, but uh, mainly because uh, people have uh, uh, increased their own uh, flats or houses by themselves, not because of construction, only small portion of this increase is due to construction. So state did not care much about that. Uh, same refers to the um, labor market, uh, but uh, this time it might be different, at least from the point of view of uh, of regional distribution of population, because most probably we will find out that Gyumri is now lower than 100,000 people. Vanadzor is already for sure lower than 100,000 people, so at least it will drive attention to, to the regions, because we've seen that uh, the whole 30-year period yeah, one was getting all the investment. Right. Only last several years, Gyumri got some, but but still not enough. So, what are your expectations of this census uh, as a as an end result? When and when do you expect these results? And finally, are the resulting data sets available to the public in general when they are finalized? Uh, resulting data sets are available, but not not in full detail. All the data which can be personalized. Uh, are not available. The rest, uh, let's say, already um, summed up data. The first uh, first uh, portion of summed up data will be available like in uh, five months or, or, or six months. Uh, the full publication is expected to be available in 12 months. So this time it will be much faster than before because this time it's uh, digitalized and the uh, conductors of census will have the tablets with them. So we will have, in reality, Armstad will be getting the data online. So in the real time, let's say. So this time it will be much faster and the data set will be much clearer. So I hope uh, with some discrepancies, with some issues, the digitalization will help. Okay, great. Okay, moving on to the next topic. Another summit at the heads of the CIS countries was held, the summit in Astana, Kazakhstan. Turkish President Erdogan was there and met with Russian President Putin. Along the sidelines of the summit, Armenian, Russian, and Azerbaijani foreign ministers Arad Mirzoyan, Sergei Lavrov, and Jehun Bayramov discussed ongoing efforts aimed at settling outstanding issues in negotiations. During this meeting, Mirzoyan emphasized to Lavrov the need to implement monitoring in order to control the violence on the Armenian-Azerbaijani border including presence of CSTO troops. Putin, however, reminded that the current CSTO chair country, Armenia, should convene a CSTO Security Council meeting and initiate that process. While Armenia continues to blame the CSTO for inaction, a Security Council meeting is still not scheduled, to our knowledge. Last week, we talked with Benjamin Pogosan, and in one of his scenarios, he noted that Armenia needs to negotiate uh, the presence of both EU and civilian monitors as well as CSTO troops on its borders in order to ward off Azari attacks and a possible invasion. Uh, Herant, what is your overall thoughts about the summit in Astana as well as this possibility of maximizing the number of uh, foreign boots on the ground as a security measure? 
let me start from the monitors and then I will switch to, to the CSTO and the CIS. Uh, regarding the monitors, first of all, the issue is that um, Russians uh, now are getting a bit jealous because uh, they had a proposition to send monitors uh, to send monitors to the region uh, significantly earlier than EU. And the first monitors arrived uh, on September 15. Uh, so immediately after they stopped uh, shooting the CSTO monitors. Uh, but uh, but Yerevan first uh, tried to bring the EU monitors. So uh, Russia has noticed that it's losing its uh, its uh, uh, influence over the region. That's first, and they really started noticing it a bit delayed. So, but uh, but that that's uh, that's reality. Now, uh, concerning uh, presence of monitors, it depends or uh, depends on their goals. If the need is security, so if our real concern is the security, so then yes, uh, the more monitors is the better. And in reality, let's say 50 monitors from CST or 50 uh, plus 50 monitors from EU is still not enough. Uh, and if it where let's say 500, it would be better. But if if there is another goal, that's an issue. For example, European monitoring mission uh, uh, among its goals or among its main goals has uh, the uh, building trust and preparation to the peace agreement with uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So that's a problem because in reality, this means that they are going to prevent Azerbaijan from shooting during the next two months until the uh, so-called peace deal will be uh, finalized. Then they can leave, and then no one can guarantee that there will no there will be no shooting. And even their time-bound uh, purpose is to pressure. Some would say uh, it would pressure Armenia into signing a disadvantageous uh, peace deal as well. At least, if not pressure, to create conditions for that. Yeah. Now, uh, concerning CSTO mission, uh, it's not uh, clear what are their objectives because, as we know, Russian diplomacy is less uh, inclined to speak publicly. But at least they are saying that they have some security elements in that as well. Uh, and we can remember the um, September 2020 um, uh, uh, preposition from CSTO. To when they were uh, when they were telling to Armenia Security Council that there will be an attack from Azerbaijan and the CSTO can uh, let's say send some weapons ammunition to Armenia if Armenia demands and there was no demand as we know now in this situation let's see how it develops but uh, but anyway. We need monitors uh, as a term for security, but uh, but not for let's say two months period only to sign some deal with Azerbaijan, which is really advantaging Azerbaijan, not Armenia. But on the other hand, uh, now there are two there are two documents being prepared uh, as a peace deal between Armenia and Azerbaijan. One with uh, with Moscow's. Uh, Interme intermediation and another is with uh, Brussels intermediation. In reality, none of these documents are beneficial for Armenia and Azerbaijan's five principles are more or less included in both. Uh, but uh, Brussels document uh, does not include anything on Artsakh, which implies in Baku's view that, uh, that Artsakh after that will completely go under, under uh, Azerbaijan's control. And that's what Azerbaijan, uh, what Pashinyan sa is saying directly as well, because all his officials are saying that we cannot do anything about Artsakh, 29,800 uh, square kilometers, and so on. And then they are saying that, as Pashinyan said, we can have a short-term good deal, but uh, but no long-term peace. That's what he said in uh, on September 14, and that he was mentioning Russian deal and or we can have long-term peace with uh, very painful concessions 
but but this this time peace will be long term. So he thinks that if he give, gives up Artsakh, uh, then, then we will have uh, long term peace. Of course, Aliyev has done any everything to prove he's wrong, but <laughs> but still, uh, but still, unfortunately, Pashinyan is uh, continuing his his approach and did not change it at all. And now concerning the Astana summit, I think the problem is that uh, Armenian diplomacy is passive uh, in every stage. So we don't have anything to say in, on the CIS meeting. We don't have to say anything in, uh, let's say, Shanghai organization meeting. And the same refers to Brussels or, or, or Washington, because we are going there to listen and to react, but not, uh, but we don't have any prepositions there. That's the biggest deal, I think, and uh, that's why now the West is more active, uh, Russia is more passive, and Armenia is sliding towards the West. Maybe tomorrow Russia will be more active, and Armenia will uh, slide more towards Russia. But but it's not a foreign policy; it's just a, an object to subject relation. So, yeah, it's a very reactive uh, policy. Yeah, but uh, I don't have. I don't think we have a luxury to have a policy like that, especially given that, uh, given that these authorities are ready to give up the biggest advantages uh, just for free. And if they give up Artsakh, this means that the next next uh, concessions will be in the price of uh, of Armenia proper, uh, and. Uh, and uh, that uh, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan will put these questions. Uh, that's obvious. They are already talking about uh, reparations and other stuff like that. So most probably there will be another issues around Armenia, around corridor, around territorial issues, and around roads, which is very important for Azerbaijan. The infrastructure pressure on Armenia. We've seen the pressure on Goriskapan road, and then there are uh, roads to Georgia and uh, another road to Iran through Tigranashen. So Azerbaijan is trying to uh, to get control over most of Armenia's roads now. So do you have any expectations, any positive outcomes from this summit? No, for sure I don't have any positive expectations. And uh, my biggest concern with all this is that mm, that in Armenia and in Artsakh, many people are expecting that something good for Armenia can happen in the outside world. So someone will decide that they, that they need to support Armenia. They hoped for a long time that Russians will decide that Turks are their enemies, so they should support Armenia. Now they have hopes uh, based on uh, Nancy Pelosi statements that Americans will do the same. But reality is that no one will support the country which is not going to support itself. So first, first you need the goal, and then you have the uh, the help for the the aid for the French movement. The same goes here. First you need leaders. First you need the political position, and then someone might help you, but not the vice versa. No one will create the factor out of nothing. So let's let's talk about Iran next. For more than a month now, Iran has been embroiled in unrest. It began with the death of a Kurdish woman, Mahsa Amini, who was arrested for not wearing a headscarf and died in police custody under suspicious circumstances. Uh, since then, protests have been raging in different cities in Iran uh, and with different degrees of violence on both sides. And the death toll from the protests varies greatly depending on who is reporting on it, obviously. But on Saturday alone, a prison holding many of the protesters went ablaze, resulting in eight deaths. And the facts around that are still being clarified, the, the circumstances. Haran, have you uh, kept an eye on these developments in Iran? And what is their significance to Armenia? Yeah, uh, the Iran's protest actions death toll, as of now, is most probably more than 200 people. And it's the biggest protest movement uh, since 1978 and 79, and uh, since the Islamic Revolution, which is an uh, important thing, and especially important for us is that in many minority populated areas, uh, the protest is very active, and it's more active than 
then in Persian populated areas, which is direct threat to territorial integrity of Iran and uh, to the border of Iran with Armenia. So uh, that's the uh, first issue. Uh, second issue is that uh, Iran is in a long-term crisis, which is obvious because uh, the protest actions in Iran have been escalating during the last uh, 15 years. It started from small, uh, small uh, protest actions by the uh, students and uh, came to this uh, nationwide protest. And it uh, has many reasons, most of which are domestic reasons, especially demographic change, social change, economic uh, slowdown, uh, but also the foreign reasons as well, because economic slowdown is uh, directly connected to the sanctions against Iran, and obviously based on the narrative and political uh, uh, activity of uh, the countries which are hostile to Iran, or the countries towards Iranian uh, leadership is hostile, uh, they are also participating in escalation of, of uh, the situation in Iran. So I think the situation in Iran is very tense. It's very tense because one month of uh, non-stop rallies is a very big thing. And uh, uh, I found uh, social opinion polls in Iran, which indicates that uh, mainly uh, the majority of population during a long time has been supportive for the Iranian authorities. But the extent of support has been declining until the recently. And uh, we don't have the most recent data, uh, but uh, generally, most probably, as of now, the extent of the support towards the political system in Iran is a bit lower than 50%, and that's already significant. And most probably among the youth, uh, the current political system is already unpopular. But on the same time, at the same time, we see the protest actions in many European countries, and it does not mean that their political system has failed if uh, people are protesting. Especially, we have seen uh, very massive protest actions in, in France, in Czech Republic, or other countries. So, again, it does not matter that, po that political system has failed, but at least there are major problems which we can observe. Again, demographic problems, uh, migration, uh, minority <clears throat> relations, uh, religious issues, so many, th and, and overcrowding of the cities, which in reality is a very underrated issue in Iran, but it's a really big issue. Helen, uh, you mentioned opinion polls. Uh, who conducted these opinion polls? Uh, can you give us a little bit more background on that? There is an organization which is called Iran Poll, which uh, conducts polls for Gallup and for security center in Maryland. So most of these polls are being published uh, on American websites. Uh, but as of now, from what I see, is that these polls, at least uh, those which were conducted by the Iran poll organization, are more or less accurate. And uh, they show consistency. And they show they are um, in line with other uh, demographic and social data which we see. For example, uh, there is uh, there are public publications since 2014, and we can see clear connection when the economic situation in Iran improves based on official GDP growth rate. The approval rate of uh, government is also improving. When when the GDP is declining, especially declined in 2018 after the new uh, group of sanctions imposed by Donald Trump. And then, uh, since then, uh, the approval rate of Iranian authorities has declined significantly as well. So, uh, so I think these polls are more or less accurate, although they are published on American websites. Uh, but another thing is that uh, I think, as of now, in Iran, there is a problem with representation of reformist group, because uh, in Iran, there are two uh, major polls in uh, major groups in, in Iranian politics, the principalists or conservatives and reformists or liberals. So usually there were like 50-50 uh, uh, in the political system, but now conservatives lead the uh, political system and uh, uh, reformists are underrepresented. And that also might be the reason because 
because when there when there is a tension within elite, it also uh, is visible in the streets. But anyway, I think we need to follow the situation in Iran very strictly, because in many people's view, if Iran will uh, get rid of, uh, let's say, of Islamic system, of the Islamic Republic system, uh, this will be improvement and improvement for Armenia as well. In reality, I don't think it's so. Because for Armenia, uh, and semi-isolated Iran is better than fully open Iran. That's reality. Because if, we are, if Iran is fully open, then Armenia does not matter for Iran. Now, Armenia matters very much for Iran. And Iran is uh, making a declaration that it will not... Uh, it will not tolerate aggression against Armenia and violation of Armenia's borders. Uh, and uh, they are conducting such statements almost every day, right. which is also a good case for Armenian security if if this government would take care. Uh, but uh, and much much more than European or CSTO observers as of now. Rant, let me ask a but, quick question on that. Uh, you say that it is better if Iran is still kind of a closed country instead of an open country. But wouldn't it be better for Armenia if the West, the U.S. and the EU had another path uh, to helping Armenia through Iran and not only through Turkey? Uh, let's say this. If Iran and EU or Iran and U.S. have new agreement, that's good for Armenia. That's good news for, news for Armenia. But if Iran's system is disposed, and Iran opens from another point of view. So the political system is destroyed. That's worse for Armenia because Iran is getting weaker. And if if there is an agreement between between EU and Iran, let's say, within the frame of... Uh, uh, Maybe the G JCPOA. The JCPOA, yes. Within this frame, it means that the both sides... Iran and the West are making concessions, but both sides' interests are respected. But if Iran's political system fails, it means that Iran will make only one-sided concessions and it will uh, lift up its uh, security block and so on. So, uh, so of course, of course, it's beneficial if, if, if they have good relations, but not on the expense of total, uh, total uh, destruction of the Iran's political system. Of course, okay. I'm not against any reform in, in Iran, but against the destruction of Iran's political system, which which is on the table because many people demand that, and especially we uh, hear such uh, um, demands from the outside of Iran. And we've seen, by the way, the activity of Iran's diaspora, which is also a very interesting factor because Iran's diaspora has never been as active as today. So uh, ultimately, if we are talking about uh, Iran's uh, situation, uh, Iran's current uh, authorities found out after 2020 that uh, the region is not uh, structured beneficial to them, mm -hmm. and they failed to recognize that uh, to recognize that Azerbaijan is preparing attack against Artsakh, and uh, they encountered the new border with Azerbaijan, which is being militarized, and uh, which gave uh, courage to those who are in northern Iran. Uh, who, are, who are separatists or who want to join Azerbaijan or create uh, create another Azerbaijan state. And, uh, of course, the Iranians uh, started acting and they started acting in the South Caucasus region as well and they started uh, conducting more active policies within their own territory. But, uh, let's say, Iranian system as of now is a bit uh, archaic and uh, is not able to catch up quickly. We will see if they are able to evolve adequately to uh, to answer to current challenges. But uh, but as of now, this um, policy towards the protests, for example, I think it's not enough and it's it's not very smart. Uh, so they are trying to just keep the system as it is, without any reform uh, and without any dialogue. They just say, "Calm down, go to home, and uh, let let it like it is." Haran, do you think these protests are actually a possible indirect consequence of Iran's failed policy towards its north uh, since the 44-day war? Not too much, of course, because uh, because the major protests started in Kurdistan, 
and um, then and now the major protest area is Sistan and Belugistan. But Azerbaijan is also one of the major areas of the protest. So somehow, yes, not not too much, but somehow, yes. And we also should take into consideration that if Iranian political regime fails, there is a big risk that uh, uh, that the next step will be at least a uh, serious try of uh, of uh, uh, separating uh, the North Iran from Iran uh, and creating there another Azerbaijan, which will be a total disaster for him. Okay, Hirant, um, before the CIS summit in Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan also hosted a conference on strengthening cooperation and trust in Asia. Iran's president, Raisi, was with Aliyev at this conference, after which Iran publicly reiterated that any changes in the historical borders and regional geopolitics are unacceptable for Iran, and that Raisi had personally emphasized this with Aliyev. There was a flood of articles in the Iranian press about this, which in itself emphasizes how strongly they mean this. Uh, soon thereafter, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard announced massive military exercises along its length, uh, of borders with Armenia and Azerbaijan. How strongly does Iran stand by its red line of not changing the borders with Armenia? Do you think they would actually go to war if they have to? Uh, I, I would not exclude it, but we should understand the circumstance. Even if Iran decides to go to war with Azerbaijan over Armenian territory, it will not be involvement in the current, uh, let's say, clashes between Armenia and Azerbaijan, but only if Azerbaijan already captured Armenian territory and cut off the road between Yevan and Tehran. Why it is so? Because there is no military command between Armenia and Iran. Armenian government is afraid of uh, uh, getting U.S. angry, and that's why they don't cooperate with Iran properly. Uh, only some very basic statements. And also Iran, by the way, has made a statement on the deployment of European observers. They said we, we are not going to tolerate the European uh, military presence in the region. So, of course, we can say that uh, they are not armed. And uh, it means that uh, Iran does not have anything to worry. But at the same time, um, uh, for Iran, it's, it's still significant and important. So that's why, first of all, Azerbaijan is trying to attack a bit uh, far from Iranian border, and mainly, uh, mainly towards uh, Jermu, Goris, and so on, but not towards Megri. And at the same time, uh, Azerbaijan has ongoing dialogue with Iran, trying to uh, decrease the tensions. Of course, Iran has this red line, and anyway, they are not going to uh, lift it up, because Iran understands the crucial meaning of Armenia because the day Iran loses border with Armenia, they are they are going to start uh, pushing Iran directly and very strictly. So it has it, it's not only about economy, although there is an economic potential because through Armenia and then Georgia, Iran can have a, a separate uh, window towards Russia or towards uh, EU, uh, and especially EU which Iran considers as a perspective market. And by the way, in EU, many would also be happy if uh, the sanctions are removed, especially in Germany and France. Uh, but uh, but that's potential thing, and which is real is the geopolitical meaning, because immediately after Iran can lose uh, the border with Armenia, they will start pushing uh, for separatism in North Iran. And uh, that's really obvious now. Uh, and uh, that's why... That's why Iran is not going to to let uh, to let Azerbaijan uh, cut uh, the road between Iran and Armenia. But now let's go back to to Armenian reaction to that. I mean, any state which is under uh, threat of uh, destruction or uh, of or occupation or aggression would uh, be happy if there is someone who is ready to support militarily. But Armenia does not do anything or at least this Armenian government doesn't do anything, to acquire Iranian support. And we have seen in Ukraine how Iranian support was significant not only for, uh, or could be significant not only for a small country like Armenia, but even for a big country like Russia. And now Iranian uh, UAVs are 
uh, affecting the situation on the ground in Ukraine. And also they are talking about the uh, missiles uh, trade with Russia. And it turns out that in, in Russia for many, it was a big surprise that Iran has lots of things which Russia does not have. But that's another story. Anyway, anyway, um, I think skipping, uh, skipping normal uh, improvement of relations with Iran and establishing uh, even uh, common command, uh, I think I, I think that's just a crime. This week, Armenian companies and websites were affected by two cyber attacks, one against a shared hosting provider, WebAM, and another one affecting an Armenian NGO, FIPAM. In the first case, the attackers defaced more than 200 websites, including Artsakh's Ministry of Finance, the Gyumri Municipality, and the South Caucasus Railway. The attackers chose to deface these websites and letting it, letting it be known that a group called AS Security Team was taking credit for the attack. In the second case, Web properties belonging to the Union of Informed Citizens were compromised and taken offline. In this case, credit was claimed by a hacker group called Turks Org. We have a short chat with Arthur Popian, a malware researcher, digital security consultant, and co-founder of CyberHub. We talk about details of these compromises, as well as uh, what website operators should take into account in order to improve security and resiliency of their website. Thank you for joining us, Arthur. Thank you for having me. Arthur, we wanted to discuss the headlines around uh, more than 200 uh, Armenian websites being compromised, um, and there were some uh, evaluations around how serious and how sophisticated these attacks were. So uh, for our listeners, could you describe uh, the most recent uh, uh, sort of attack against Armenian uh, websites and what it entailed? Uh, So um, most recently, um, i.e., a couple of days ago, basically, there were two big hacks in Armenia. Uh, one hack was directed at a large web hosting company. Uh, so what happened is apparently uh, Azerbaijani hackers um, tried to hack into a website, very probably uh, the finance ministry of Artsakh website. When doing that, they discovered that it's on a large Armenian web hosting company, WebAM server. Uh, They compromised either the website or somehow broke into it and cut into the network and then broke every other website that they could find on the same server or on the same network, basically. So um, when investigating, we found uh, a bunch of IPs, all of them basically pointing to the same servers. Uh, So it was uh, one big hack, and as a result, what they did is they replaced the index file of all those websites. So all of those websites, 218 of them, were showing a black background with Azerbaijani army video promotion and some quotes from uh, Ilham Aliyev. Uh, So that was basically it. The funny thing was that the hackers had even inserted their Google Analytics code to to just observe how many people are visiting those sites. I mean, interesting. The guys the guys care about the feedback or how do they say KPIs to see how effective <laughs> they've been. Um, well, did, but I mentioned did they put any ads on the website. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but I mean, I mentioned two hacks, and yes. that's interesting because on the same day we also discovered that um, a AM which is an Armenian, an Armenian NGO, which does a fact-checking website, fact info investigation platform. So um, the server which hosted VPAM's websites was also compromised and four of their sites were, uh, two of their sites were taken down and uh, they had to, and that was a different hack. And we're still in the middle of investigating that, but apparently that one was Turkish hackers. So if the first one, was presented as a very sec team or something like a hacker mm-hmm. group like that. And I'm, I'm not the one to promote them too, too much here. And the other one was apparently from Turkey and we're still looking into that one. Okay. And how can you tell if it's uh, from Turkey? Was it because they claimed so, or was it because of, I, you know, IP address traffic? Uh, and uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? So um, what we have here, attribution is like really tricky. For all I know, mm, it of could course, be some yeah. Russian, American, or Israeli hackers. But uh, the 218 were claimed by a group which called itself ASSEC team, which mm-hmm. is a team which we have, we have been multiple times before as well. And it was a, a hack, but also a deface attack. 
And there's right. a difference. So hacking is to get into the network or get into something. But then what they did is they defaced those websites. Uh, mm -hmm. So that you can do a lot of things with a website once or hosting once you've compromised. These guys have chosen to do the defacing, which is a more of a, a simpler attack, uh, but more of a promotional thing. Yeah. And the second one was uh, just basically DOS, like uh, denial of service. So the websites were down and they weren't wor working uh, for all I know. Uh, at this moment, I got some of the data to investigate, so we will know more. Uh, but basically, the second one was more like just plainly trying to do damage. Talking about this attack, for instance, against the 200 plus websites, you know, there are some, I guess it's a shared hosting provider and there are some websites that belong to government, at least no Artsakh government, you know, or what, what kind of advice would you give to people operating serious websites? Is there anything that the, you know, operators of these websites could uh, learn from these incidents in order to have a more secure site? Sure. Um, so there are a lot of things to get first, get down first. Everything is hacked. Like, I mean, you cannot have absolute security. Uh, Apple releases security patches every other day, and it's the world's like largest company. Google issues security. Like so, um, I don't find it justifiable to point a finger at the web hosting provider and say, "Look, this guy's got got hacked," because everybody is hacked all the time. Uh, so that's important. No, uh, what is also important to understand is that WebAM um, credit to them. Uh, they were able to quickly restore all the websites, um, at least all of the ones that I'm monitoring, including a couple of NGO websites, which are under our support. Uh, like those guys were quickly to restore it. So in choosing a provider or in choosing a hosting solution, I guess it's not as important to make sure that it's absolutely impenetrable because there's no such thing. The most important thing is, do you have a scenario to recover from backup fast and get the business running back again? So in this regard, I don't know, some of the sites were out for two, three hours, um, morning hours for Armenia, that's nothing. Um, the second thing is that most, uh, most Armenian website owners, they didn't even notice or, or know. So I was calling some of the people I work with uh, because they're NGOs or human rights defenders. And I was like, you guys, your website is down. And they're like, oh, really? <laughs> it's, the, mm -hmm. it's the first that's the first person I'm hearing that from. So basically what I'm trying to say is uh, websites are not as important for many of um, Armenian organizations when they do their business. A lot of them have moved into social networks. Facebook pages are often the most visited resource. So, um, I mean, let's not make too much of this. Okay, yeah. there was an attack. A hosting was compromised. So some other guys had fun, um, I don't know, posting some images and video of their beloved dictator or something, but I mean, who cares? And nobody outside of Armenia cares either. The, the one thing I care is probably, yes, um, there were um, Azatazen, Voma websites, uh, mm -hmm. which are you know, the initiatives which are trying to create some sort of civil defense initiatives, and they were also on the same server. So, um, and this happened at a time when those guys were, you know, posting schedules of when to go and groups, etc. So that one was probably the most uh, one which I cared about. And the railway stations website was also there. And that one is tricky. I mean, I cannot even be 100% sure how it happened because it was behind another server, um, which was Ucom. And then there was another, so like it was, it's a whole infrastructure thing, but apparently the, the website itself is either hosted or somehow connected to WebAM. Right. Uh, and this part, like, I'm, I'm trying to get more feedback uh, to, to understand what's happening with that. So those are the main things. So uh, when choosing a hosting provider or a solution, maybe you choose a standalone server, a VPS, VPS. Yeah, a dedicated whatever. maybe. Yeah, whatever you choose, it's important to make sure that it has a proper backup solution. It has several ways of backup and to test backups. So uh, we had a live test on WebAM. We know that those 218 websites, if hacked, they can keep, get back online in uh, three hours, which is great. I mean, to know. Uh, and also the hosting, the ones that I'm monitoring personally or, or have access to, I've looked at that, they haven't lost any data, which is also great. 
So apparently they're, the backups are pretty frequent. Um, now, as for general advice, I guess it's important to have for, for people who have websites to have some way of monitoring whether it's up, down, or something has changed for that. I mean, there are automated solutions which will check if your website is there and send you an email or notification if something's up. Um, I don't know if anybody is doing it apart from a couple of digital security people I know in Armenia, mm-hmm. but that's a good idea. If, if you're running a website, you have a responsibility to monitor it. Um, another problem or issue is whether there is anybody really doing investigation. I mean, I'm doing it, uh, CyberHub is doing this because uh, just we want to know, but um, this shouldn't be up to us to do it, right? Uh, this yeah. should be something for, I don't know, security services, uh, investigators, uh, just going there, figuring out, punishing if there is a sysadmin who was uh, you know, not on the job or not doing something properly. And uh, we never see these happen. Uh, so actually, this is, again, not something for website owners to have, but this is something for the country to have, a way of monitoring, investigating, making sure the security is up on a level. Because, uh, I mean, these were general regular sites, a couple of Artsakh sites, etc. But we've seen even government websites broken into and we never heard yeah. back. You know, at least for things that affect national security, right? You know, uh, that's, that, that's your point. Um, and just, uh, you know, for as a way of introduction, can you tell us a little bit more about CyberHub, when it was started and what type of work do you do? Oh, Cyber Hub, uh, I mean, um, we have two co-founders. It's myself and Samvel Martirisian, who hardly needs any introduction. We're mm-hmm. both journalists and we're both, as journalists, um, for many, many years, as people who are also tech savvy, people would come to us with lots of questions, like how to unblock my Facebook or what hosting solution to you know, choose, etc. So this started back, let's say, in 2003, 4. So uh, at some point in 2018, we decided like these people keep coming to us with questions and we spend hours of time helping them. Let's just formalize it somehow. So we created something called CyberHub, which is actually a computer emergency response team. Uh, The team has about eight people now, um, Mm -hmm. highly technical uh, people. And we have also people who work with us, although they're not members of our team directly but try to contribute we have established very great contacts like we work with uh, i don't know human rights watch citizen lab amnesty tech uh, those type of big uh, international organizations we have some working partnership with meta which is the facebook's parent company we have some access to i don't know unblocking accounts in various profiles and we're basically trying to provide free support to armenian non-governments uh, activist groups uh vulnerable you know groups activists human rights defenders uh, seems to be working so far um we have a lot of a lot of requests and we've been expanding the team and we're trying to fund it from various sources including you know our own personal finances but as well as getting some grants and uh, private private support very good well i wish you success in your work and uh, i think that what you do is uh, important so Uh, I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. This week, October 12th, was the second anniversary of the attack against the Tsor artillery unit, whose members perished near Juvarlu in Hadrut during the 44-day war. Parents and relatives of the fallen servicemen have initiated a criminal complaint against the then commander of the Artsakh Defense Forces, Jalal Harutsunyan, artillery commander Gennady Batasayan, and Major Gevor Gevorkan for misdirecting the men, deploying them too close to the front line and giving them incorrect information. The families and relatives of the fallen heroes suffered a harrowing ordeal for 13 months, searching the sites of the fighting in freezing winter and hot summer weather, until finally some relics were recovered and laid to rest. October 12th is a day when the relatives remember their fallen heroes, many of whom were posthumously awarded the Battle Cross Medal. Here's a short excerpt from our archives of a discussion we had with two of the relatives, Nayara Melikian, mother of Haik Melikian, and Yerushe Zakuns, relative of Ruben Pogosan. This discussion was recorded on May 7, 2022 at the sidelines of the resistance movement protest. So apologies in advance for the poor audio quality and background noise. 
Um, I would like to just introduce our uh, case. We are the uh, parents and relatives of 20 soldiers. Uh, they were uh, artillerists in uh, Tsorj uh, in uh, Stepanakert. Originally, they were located to Vazgenashen region during the war after when Pashinyan decided to be the general's traitors. They decided with Jalal Harutunyan to do attack, counter-attack to Azerbaijani armies, which we find out they, it was not not to do that in that time because uh, by military policy, it wasn't, we, we weren't uh, able and we weren't, uh, on, in that case, couldn't do that. Anyway, and they relocated our kids. Uh, they relocated to Hadruti region, Juvarlu. And in that time, there was a group of uh, soldiers of Azerbaijani coming towards them. One of the uh, head of the military, they they contacted to Jalal, Gena Berda Bardasaran first, who was head of artillery in uh, Artsakh. And that uh, Gena, he contacted to Jalal, asked, please let us know, are there Armenians or Azerbaijani? Jalal told them that 100% ours do not fire. The fire. You know, we are insisting that this was a deliberate massacre, actually, because there are a lot of proof, you know, that we have uh, filed a uh, complaint against uh, the group of officers, including Jalal Harutunyan and his deputy Gennady Bagdasaran, who was the head of the artillery of the Defense Army. And uh, when we're reading all this investigation, uh, about six books of investigation, you know, it's just a red line, it was... Uh, um, deliberate murder. And as Yerish has said, uh, this Jalal Harutunyan and his deputy, without having any investigation, without just uh, following the device and the reports of the officers who were on the ground and were just reporting that Hadrut had fallen and that that uh, location, that area, is under other troops. They still insisted that our uh, boys were just taken to the Juvaru uh, spot. And actually, furthermore, he ordered, don't shoot, it's our truth, when uh, the boys just noticed uh, that some troops were just uh, uh, coming closer, yeah, and uh, they just uh, called him for additional uh, orders, so he told them, don't shoot, and then the Turks came closer, and they just slaughtered everybody, and I want to add also that, you know, my son was just shooting, and when the officers were running away, then they ran over my son and they left him alone there dying. And when at the end the others came down of that hill and they started just uh, killing and uh, I don't know what else they did, my son was alive till the, the last minute. Everybody, all the witnesses are telling that he was alive. But he was left there and then what they did to my son, I don't know. But till today, I got only one bone of this upper feet and I'm still dreaming of getting more relics of my son. So this is Nikol Pashinyan. Also, this is his Kunta, yes. who did all this to our country, to our people. I'd like to add that artillerists, probably, guys, you, most of you don't know, artillerists, they are not equipped to fire. They, are, they don't have, they have guns, but they have only very few patro, patro, no, bullets. bullets to to fire. And uh, from, yeah, from 35, uh, the, the artillerists, the B-20, the they were able to fire at 17 kilometers. But Gena Baghdad somehow relocated them very close to Azerbaijanis. They were firing three and a half kilometers instead of uh, keeping them back from front line. Without having idea where is the front line, they put our kids in front front line with Azerbaijanis. And after that, what when on October 12th, that uh, situation, that attack happens to our kids. We were we weren't able to find out where are they, what's happening to them. The f phones uh, they were out of uh, order. We were contacting the Ministry of uh, Defense. They were telling us any lies can possibly be. 
they are in underground, they are in a safe place, don't worry about that. And then from 35 people, 15, they were able to get out from there, injured, some of them. And we, from them, we find out what's happened to our kids. And we started our uh, line how to find the kids, how to find if there were all of them. And we find out from uh, Telegram, Colorit 18 videos that our kids, they were killed and they, they, they filmed it and they put it in the Telegram. But we weren't able to find out all those 20 kids are there or not. We started uh, going there with our investigation. Go ahead, Narajan. We started our own investigation and we were looking for them for 13 months. And after 13 months or after all our efforts and all through our uh, just personal ties, uh, connections, so we found them. So the other uh, side finally handed over these 11 uh, relics and they were all our children. And we knew that they have done it deliberately again, not handing them back to us just uh, making us suffer for 13 uh, months. And, you know, I want also to recall the statement by Edgar Ghazarian. He said, you know, there wasn't uh, one day during the entire history of the Armenian people that Armenian people have given birth to 800 boys. But during the 44-month uh, uh, war in Artsakh, there was just one day when 800 boys were slaughtered because of high treason. And I want you just to imagine what is this for our, it's what a golden genetic fund. And it was eliminated in one day. And they have to be punished. This is all we want. We want justice and we want them to be punished. That concludes our program for this Week in Review episode. We hope it has helped your understanding of some of the issues from the previous week. We look forward to your feedback and your suggestions for issues to cover in greater depth. Contact us on our website at grung.org or on our Facebook page ANN-Grung or in our Facebook group Grung-Armenian News Network. Special thanks to Laura Osborne for providing the music for our podcast. On behalf of everyone in this episode, we wish you a good week. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels, like our pages, and follow us on social media. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.